experts from all over the world. Uh, thanks, Dr. Karthik, for nice introduction. So my case today is a 50-year-old female from affluent society who was a housewife by occupation. She came to my pain OPD with presenting complaints of pain in the left post-auricular region. And it was involving the region around angle of mandible, ramus of mandible, and it was radiating up to occipital temporal region also on the one side. And many a times it, she complained of pain in complete half of the uh, head. These complaints she is having present, presently, she, this, these complaints she is having since one month. This pain is variable in severity. It has no diurnal variations, no aggravating factors like diet or no relieving factors uh, like some food items or caffeine intake or something like that. She has no pain has no relation with exposure to sun or there is no photosensitivity. There are no aura symptoms of aura and premonitory symptoms. Pain is not associated with movements of jaws, mouth opening, uh, swallowing movements. There is no associate uh, no associated nasal stuffiness, uh, conjunctival redness or lacrimation or something like that. Also, she is not having any complaints of nausea and vomiting. No blurring of vision, doubling of vision, or fainting attacks. No episode, uh, no episodes of seizures till now. Pain. If if we check the variety of the pain, it is the nociceptive type of pain, but uh, also associated with tingling and numbness, uh, especially in the occipital region. The pain radiates to the occipital region. On NRS, pain is quite severe. It is up to eight by ten, and presently she is having started developing complaints of sleep disturbances. Uh, along with pain episodes. In the past, she's, uh, she's having similar complaints since two years, which uh, persist for a week or so every time. And uh, she keeps on taking some medications and she uh, has visited so many other physicians, uh, neurologists, ENT surgeons, and some other surgeons also. And they have been keep, uh, prescribing her with some anti-neuropathic drugs or some antidepressants. She's on gabapentin, she has received carbamazepine, and every time she gets some or the other uh, partial relief, but she is not satisfied with that relief. And presently, she has started developing anxiety attacks, panic attacks. Now she has developed psychological symptoms also, and associated sleep disturbances is there now. So now she is in the real misery. She has a very severe pain, and she is in acute distress due to that pain. And she has lost interest in her day-to-day -day activities too. Only history which I got was the history of uh, some ENT operation. When I checked the files, so she was operated for stepidectomy in 2017. Uh, there is a post mastoid scar available. Also, she is a known case of diabetic and hypertensive, but she is on reasonably good control on oral drugs. No other history of any chronic illness, no history of any rashes or end organ damage or some trauma or no other uh, neurological disorders. There's also no history of any post past viral infections and major critical illnesses, any ICU admission or so on. So as I said, personal history is almost normal, but now she has loss of appetite, pay, uh, uh, sleep disturbances, and uh, in the recent past, she has lately developed loss of interest in sexual life also. So because of her misery, she is suffering a lot. On local examination, again, Everything was normal. There was no tout segments. There was no uh, trigger points. There was no lump or local swelling or some hypo or hyperpigmented patches, no dilated veins. Systemic examination was also normal. CNS-wise, reflexes were normal. Cranial nerves were normal. Cervical spine was also normal. All the signs were negative. Investigation-wise, uh, she has been investigated a lot. Multiple times she has done biochemical markers, calcium levels, magnesium levels vitamin B12, uric acid, RA factor, ANCA uh, antibodies. She's, uh, uh, all, the, all the investigations are normal. CT brain and HRCT temporal bone has been done twice. Again, no evidence of any space occupying lesion or some soft tissue abnormality. MRI brain is also normal. And MRI angiography of intracranial vessels was done, which was also normal. EMG only showed, uh, nerve conduction study showed mild degeneration of peripheral nerves in the upper neck region. Otherwise, everything is normal. So, so this was the case. Okay, Dr. Umesh, you've got all of us interested. It's not going anywhere. It's a, um, 
slightly not a straightforward case is what i would say so somebody a 50 year old lady with history of pain around the left ear um and uh, looks like a debilitating neuropathic type of pain around the left ear so can i start with um, uh dr jaden so in terms of differential diagnosis 50 year old uh, lady left sided ear pain with vague history of previous ear surgery not aggravated by neck symptoms pain radiating a little bit to the occiput uh, no radiation cervical radiculopathy sort of symptoms so in terms of differential diagnosis jordan sir what all we should consider yeah thank you dr karthik and uh, really it was um, very elaboratedly presented by uh, speaker but uh, before i dwell on to upon to the differentials one or two points which are i think not intentionally but by the way missed i would like to mention and then i will come to the uh, diagnosis uh, he has examined the patient and there is no tender points or no other things are there but it would have been better if you could have taken the sensory examination into the consideration some changes um, or some paresthesia in that particular area that is one number two uh, not directly indicating a neuralgic pain or the occipital neuralgia but the tunnel sign it would have been elicited in those particular area would have helped us to clinch the diagnosis now i am coming to the differentials okay Any okay pain dr jadan you can yes, ask sir. it right now to to dr uh, uh, umesh Ramthani. that whether whether this was there or not whether he has ah. sorry sir yeah, yeah. if so, i missed that but actually i didn't i only missed it mentioning but i didn't miss it on the patient that's why i no... said <laughs> <laughs> so you, it was not there it was not I mean, there there were no sensory or hypoesthetic patches or uh, which you were mentioning a tunnel sign was also negative okay fine so th that the two things uh, could have cleansed the diagnosis so i am coming to the differentials uh, pain actually arising from the neck involving the lower jaw or the posterior auricular area and also going ever towards the scalp have many differential diagnoses the pain can arise from the ear like otitis media or the otitis externa it can arise from the cervical area we call it the cervicogenic uh, headache or cervical pain which is radiating to that maybe because of facetal diseases it may be because of the previous surgery which he has mentioned so like occipital neuralgia coming very high in the differential diagnosis then the other causes which are rare but systemic lupus of c2 c3 can cause this problem any surgical trauma to particular nerves of that area can also cause that problem and we should not forget the trigeminal neuralgia can also be one of the cause of this problem then there is cervicogenic headache and then there is a tension headache so these are the few um, diagnoses comes in my mind um, and but one by one we have to differentiate them and reach to the conclusion yeah dr karthik thank you sir so um, dr jaden mentioned about uh, uh, pain arising from the cervical spine we talked about uh, um, occipital neuralgia pain arising from the ear itself um uh, uh we also talked about trigeminal so uh, can i call in uh, yeah just just before before we proceed one another just point i missed out we should also rule out the causes of pain from the tooth that may be one of the cause of pain in that particular area yeah so common to find uh, uh, pain from oral origin uh, radiating to the ear so a lot of times patients with uh, conditions like root canal and uh, tooth radiating to the ear is common right um, i can see dr joy shri is here uh, 
uh, must be early in the morning for her in the US. I'm happy to see you here. What is the differential diagnosis you are thinking about in a patient like this? Hey, thank you. Nice to see you all. Um, I was going to point out when uh, Ashok Jadam was finishing that um, the main thing is if the patient had any recent tooth extractions or anything related to the tooth. One other thing, I think, you know, the history has been extensively covered. Uh, the other thing to keep, uh, to be aware of is if the patient had any TMJ, bruxism, like they do, they grind their teeth often. And um, those grinding of the teeth can also sometimes cause pain in that area. Or did they have any TMJ is something to be aware of. Other than that, um, uh, was there uh, only sometimes, you know, you can have parotid gland involvement or, you know, a small stone which can cause, but then, you know, there are other things to look for is if there is some increased salivation or decreased salivation or swelling as they eat, which are not mentioned. Other than that, I can't think of anything else. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So Dr. Joy Shree feels that uh, it could be of a dental origin. Uh, she's also thrown in the parotid and the salivary gland could contribute to the pain that is uh, around the ear. Yeah, so a lot of times uh, pain of the dental origin does radiate up. Now, uh, can I call in Ravi here and ask him, could this be a elongated styloid process causing something like a glossopharyngeal neuralgia or a nasal syndrome? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. So first of all, uh, it was a very elaborated history taken. And uh, I think uh, this is the one of the most difficult cases till now we have discussed. Going through this uh, entire case history, um, I was uh, means thinking uh, last night, uh, Dr. Das sir sent me this, uh, the case history. And since last night, I was going through the literature, what could it be? And you can not think of any other Thing apart from all these uh, Jardin sir and uh, Josie, um, Josie ma'am has already told, but uh, three or four things already left, which are particularly specific to this uh, entity that is uh, affecting the patient. One thing that you Karthik sir told is uh, your uh, this uh, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, that elongated steroid process uh, compressing this glossopharyngeal nerve. Specifically, in Ramtani sir told about the stapedius surgery and having a scar over this posterior, post auricular area. So one nerve is over there that is specifically talking to you is your greater auricular nerve. So in literature, it has been mentioned that uh, greater auricular neuralgia and typically symptoms are matching towards this. Three things I would like to discuss here pain over the angle of mandible, tingling and numbness sensation, going before just behind the ear and reaching up to the occiput. So this is the territory of C2, C3 now. So greater auricular neuralgia can be a differential diagnosis. Second is your stylgia. Third is your eagle syndrome or glossopharyngeal neuralgia. And all other entities have been already discussed, I think, sir. Right. Uh, can I call in Dr. Varsha now and ask her, could it be something much more simpler like a migraine? Yes, migraine has been already uh, covered in the history by Dr. Umesh, which I went through. But definitely migraine is a differential diagnosis here, considering the area of pain. And in the history, as he has rightly mentioned, He's ruled out the symptoms related to migraine, like aura or anything, premonitory symptoms like that. But when it comes to migraine, <clears throat> it's more likely that it will have some consistent association. He said there is no uh, diurnal or no uh, precipitating uh, factors or triggers what we commonly come across in migraine. So right. the reason migraine definitely is a differential diagnosis. And here it has been uh, covered by Dr. Umesh. Thank you, Dr. Varsha. 
Um, uh, can I call in Dr. Matthew Tong here? Dr. Matthew, I saw your video was on. Oh, hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I, 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 I think most of the uh, different shows have all been covered by the other speakers. Uh, in particular, I could, um, could, uh, could get from my experience in nerve damage, uh, pain that arises from nerve damage in an incision. I have done some work on peripheral nerves with other surgeons like hand surgeons. Uh. They're, they're, when a nerve is cut, uh, they like to rejoin it, not because they want to preserve function. They want to rejoin it so that the nerve doesn't give rise to neuralgia. And uh, when they have a defect, they even get some uh, uh, substitute to, to anastomose the nerve to it. And they don't really care that the distal end must be, must be joined, you know. As long as the proximal end is joined to something for it to grow into, it seems that the, the, the pain uh, pro, uh, process can be, 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 be dampened down. Uh, that's about all I can say. And the incision, I'm also surprised, that is the bidectomy uh, is usually carried out inside the uh, external auditory meatus, you know. Uh, but this one is a post-auricular incision. Uh, so it has a lot of... Uh, opportunity to, to injure cutaneous nerves uh, and in particular the lesser occipital nerve over there. When I do acoustic surgery, I will definitely see a big huge nerve uh, which, is, which is cut. Okay, that's my limited uh, uh, contribution that I can make. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Uh, uh, Dr. Umesh, you mentioned the stepidectomy and was there a mastoid surgery, did you mention? And how long ago was these surgeries? So that's what uh, my question is to Dr. Tong, because uh, sir said that this must be the um, post-surgical type of pain. But in my patient, the pain started in 2019 or so. But the surgery was performed 2017. So two years gap is there. And surgery was uh, actually, Dr. Ravi pointed out about the Eagle syndrome. So this was the first thing which came into my mind also. But uh, that has been already ruled out by imaging uh, studies that there is no elongated styloid process. And uh, even the ENT surgeon has also ruled out that uh, pathology, actually, before only. Right. So two years is actually not a bad time for post-surgery pain to come. And especially if it is a auricular neuralgia after the nerve has been cut, I think two years is pretty much a perfect time for that sort of symptoms. I right. think, sir, uh, here I would uh, like to add one more thing. The stepidectomy surgery, especially stepidus is in middle ear. And middle ear contents also includes this tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve. So mm. one of the chances are damaging this nerve and leading to the glossopharyngeal uh, uh, neuralgia the symptoms, center. Uh, symptoms are quite different from glossopharyngeal neuralgia as such because there is no association with mouth opening or some tongue movements and pain is not inside the buccal mucosa or in the base of uh, pillars, uh, auricular pillars, which is classically in the glossopharyngeal neuralgia, basically. Pain is somewhat posterior, the area which you right, uh, rightly pointed out, the area which mm -hmm. is there. What are the, uh, the, the, the results of her stabidectomy? Did it restore her hearing? Or could it be after two years or three years, the stabidectomy, the prosthesis has uh, dislocated and her hearing has, uh, has gone down again. And sometimes the, the uh, prosthesis failure might uh, result in intermittent pain. Like what you said, this person's pain is actually intermittent, yeah? Not, not continuous, yeah? Yes. Yes, it's intermittent and it is recurrent. And basically, since two years, uh, multiple episodes of pain she has experienced. And every episode persists for eight or ten days or so, and then it goes away. Uh, Doctor Umesh, I just one point I just wanted to ask you: Is there any ear symptoms like discharge or recurrent fever or uh, no, coming no. swelling in the posterior uh, auricular area? No, no, uh, no swelling. Or no what ENT about symptoms. the 
What about no, the hearing? Didn't. Hearing, hearing. Is it okay, normal, or some decrease hearing on that side? No, no hearing. Uh, diminution of hearing is not there. Basically, when she was she first time was operated, she was only operated for the ear ache. There was persistent ear ache, and there was a uh, some uh, deformity in stepedial stepedial process. So that's why for that surgery was performed. But hearing diminution of hearing was uh, never a complaint for. And presently also she is not having ENT complaints. Right. So we have somebody with uh, pretty much classical neuropathic pain, which is not responding to anti-neuropathic pain medicine. And uh, at this point of time, we don't have a clear-cut diagnosis. So, Karthik. Uh, yes. Karthik. Yes. Yes, okay. sir. I want to share some story of uh, today only. Today only, you know, uh, I don't know whether uh, in this meeting... Akanka is there? Akanka or? Uh... Yes, sir. So, uh, today's case was seen by you or Basopraj? Who was there in the today's case? Sir, me so and today, exactly, okay. Let me, let me, let me tell. They have taken the history today. Exactly the same patient. Exactly. Means the distribution of pain is in the angle of the mandible. Uh, around the styloid process, you can say. The pain is going some part of the occipital area, some part of the fetal by initially once by as a trigeminal neuralgia, once as a glossopharyngeal neuralgia, once as you know some epigenic head everything. Means distribution of pain. Is, am I right, Doctor Doctor Umesh? That some part of the face, one side of the face, not the other side, and uh, the angle of the mandible are here. And some part of the occiput and the neck. Yes, so this exactly. is the distribution of the pain. Yes, exactly. So what happened today? Also, we have taken the careful history. He was also she was also not he she also female also here. But here the CT scan was showing the elongated stylet process, and uh, he was actually being referred by ENT surgeon. And somebody was telling here that okay, whether we should take this uh, ENT surgeon's opinion. So this patient. Two days, our patient was referred by ENT surgeon that there was an elongated spinal uh, styloid process, uh, but there was wise that they have not operated the styloid process because the distribution of the pain is not matching with the typical glossopharyngeal neuralgia. It's not typically matching with the Eagle syndrome. Eagle syndrome pain will be more related on this area on the posterior the angle of the mandible, some part of the throat or something. It should not go in the face. It should not you know, come into the teeth. It should not go too much posterior to the occipital area. And there was no history of any surgery. Today's case, what we have seen, no history of any surgery, no history of any trauma. So now, what I want to mention, just, you know, really we don't know, we are, we are in the dark regarding the diagnosis of today's Dr. Umesh's case. And we was also similarly was in dark in about today's case, what we have saw today. So the thing is, if you are going back into the literature and uh, that any neuropathic pain that whether it is coming as an nerve injury or sometimes just demyelination. Like if you are looking about the idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, there is, there is not always that there will be vessels to be impinging. There might be the just idiopathic demyelination of the nerve, which can start the problem. But later on, there is another import, important entity, which is more known with the trigeminal as a trigeminal neuropathy. That means if some nerve damage and nerve entrapment or similar kind of things goes on for a longer time, the pain is no longer limited to the territory of that particular nerve or nerve root. So what happens, the inter, inter, in, the, in the higher centers, in the brain or in the, in the spinal cord, whatever it's the case, the interneurons develops and they make connections to the adjacent areas, adjacent nucleus, and the pain gradually, gradually spreads over the area. If you are looking back about the central sensitization, this is one of the very important aspects that if some pain continues for some time, then the area of the pain is spreading over that and it is recruited. It is, it is something what Dr. Matthew was also telling that if there is a nerve injury, then what happens when there is a regeneration, there is a sprouting, other nerves are recruited, sympathetic nerves are recruited, and then the typical distribution pattern of that particular nerve is not there. So it is basically spreading to the adjacent segments, adjacent areas, and by that, at the, that is the time when it is very difficult to make a diagnosis. So better term is a, is a, is a, is a neuropathy, but whether it should be called as a trigeminal neuropathy or 
Hospital neuropathy, or it may be in the distribution of the positive, like our case was, we was also thinking about that it might be starting with the, you know, the some of the occipital nerves, greater, lesser, or least occipital nerves. So uh, the thing is that uh, it, it's a difficult case, difficult to make any diagnosis, no straightforward diagnosis. But in this situation, what can be done? Some of the diagnostic block, like in our case, what we planned, that we will be going for some of the diagnostic blocks, diagnostic interventions. Our target for our case was, of course, the glossopharyngeal nerve was one because our, we, in our case, there was a elongated styloid process. So glossopharyngeal nerve diagnostic block. We also planned for the spinopalatine ganglion because this area is supplied by the spinopalatine ganglion. So this kind of the neuropathic pain might be responding to the, uh, which is particularly not limited to a particular nerve territory. The spinopalatine ganglion block can be a good option or other nerve by which uh, we can come to a conclusion. The thing what is here in these patients and in our patient also, what we are discussing, that it is it is strictly unilateral. It is not spread to the other side. That you know, the, it, it, is, uh, it is not that, that it is going to the other side. It is strictly unilateral. So it might be, like coming back to the UMS's cases, it might be started with the, some of these cases. Means it might be because of the auricular nerve injury. It might be because of the any of the other glossopharyngeal urgia or this kind of things. And gradually, because of this development of the neuropathy later on, the area of the, of the, of the territory is spreading and no longer matching or no longer restricted to that particular nerve territory. So this is, this is one, of the one of the possibilities. And uh, I would like to go with the diagnostic block with these kind of things to come to a conclusion. Right. Uh, Dr. Umesh, we have taken an ENT and dental opinion, correct, in your case? Yes, sir. Rather, and, ENT surgeon has uh, referred the case to me, actually. And the dental My surgeon case. and the dental surgeon has ruled out the common dental pathologies, the TM joint, yes. the bruxism, and yes, all yes. that has been ruled out. Yes, yes. The institute from which she was referred, and they had actually they operated her also, and then later on, she was recurrently evaluated also. And even neurologist also has, was concerned. She was consulting to the neurologist also. So they had they kept on prescribing different different drugs, but she was not getting the same. You know, our case, our case was exactly similar. Referred to us by ENT surgeon. He was yes. excluded that dental causes. He has been seen by the neurologist. He has been prescribed Tegretol and the other all the other drugs, yes. and uh, yes. you know getting a lot of side effects of the drug and there was no improvement. So there are you know, similar kind of cases was there today's case. <laughs> nice coincidence, actually. Right. Um, so uh, in terms of diagnosis, from what the experts say, looks like uh, we are left with three common possibilities. One is the auricular neuralgia. Second is uh, glossopharyngeal. And the third is because of... Um, the inner ear itself, considering the dental has been rolled out. So I would like to ask Joyce ma'am, if there is a role for a diagnostic block in this case, uh, considering conservative management is not exactly working and the patient is on neuropathic pain medicine and it's still not helping, in terms of diagnostic block, would she consider something and if so, which diagnostic block? See, since we honed it down to three things, uh, yes, diagnostic block, instead of putting more medications or anything, the easiest thing for us to do as interventional pain physician is do a diagnostic block. So, see, most of us have honed in and felt, felt that it could be the auricular nerve. So we can start there, do a diagnostic with uh, lidocaine 2%. You know, you can use ultrasound very easily. Or you can use, if you want to combine your fluoro and ultrasound to make sure your needle is in the right place. Usually you can do this with a uh, ultrasound block. If suppose, let's say you did auricular, it didn't work. Then maybe you can try either a sphenopalatine ganglion or if you felt more that it was one of the branches of trigeminal, I would... Um, try and do a trigeminal block. But I would start with the auriculotemporal nerve block to see if the pain went away. That would be the first thing that I would do. Um, my third on the line for a, 
um, diagnostic block. Of course, you know, I am not saying it is occipital neuralgia, but there has been mentioned in the history that the pain radiates to the occipital region. That would be the last thing that I would try in case, you know, sometimes with these patients, what I have seen is um, uh, I am dealing with a young patient who had like a tooth extraction, but he keeps saying he has pain on the left side of his face. So I used an ultrasound guided mandibular nerve block. So he had numbness, but then there was one particular spot which looked like it was a superior alveolar nerve distribution right over the tooth. I tried to tell him that if he is going for the re-implant of his tooth, he should wait till the dentist does his block where all his mouth would be covered because he's young. He doesn't want to take any medication. If the pain is very bad, he would take gabapentin 100 or 200 milligrams at bedtime. So sometimes, you know, so then I combine maxillary, mandibular, uh, talk to him. Everything was numb except one spot right over the tooth where he had the pathology. So sometimes these nerve blocks, you just have to be patient. Sometimes you might have to do one, wait, do the next one. But there are no straightforward answers, unfortunately, at times. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ravi, can I ask you, if you're considering more of a glossopharyngeal neuralgia, how would you go about doing your diagnostic? And if your diagnostic was positive, and if it was indeed the glossopharyngeal nerve compression, Eagle syndrome, how would you go about treating this patient? Sir, uh, if uh, you are considering this as a Eagle syndrome, so previously, I mean, initially, I will go with the conservative management starting with this uh, amitriptyline, tricyclic antidepressants, and uh, second line of drugs will be the gabapentinoids, especially including pregabaline and gabapentin. And uh, we'll give a trial of these all antineuroleptic medications, say for a period of four to six weeks. And uh, if there is certain pain relief, we'll try increasing or scalping the dose. But uh, if not adequate pain relief, we will directly go with a diagnostic block, as Dr. Dasar was telling. And uh, usually what we do, we usually perform a fluoroscopic guided uh, diagnostic block utilizing less than 1 ml and targeting the steroid process. So 1 ml of 1% lignocaine, we use it and we and just uh, try to get the results. And if uh, the patient is having more than say 50% pain relief, so we consider it as a diagnostic confirmation. And uh, if again, so... Regarding the therapeutic options, initially what we I do is uh, add some dexamethasone, 4 milligram of dexamethasone along with that. So it provides certain bit of uh, pain relief. But patients again keep coming and again and again. So again, say, say 6 to 8 days only pain relief with a single injection. And uh, thereafter, uh, we have tried here pulse radio frequency. But uh, out of six or seven patients, only three or four patients are again having good relief with pulse radio frequency of this now. So two options, only local anesthetic steroid and second is your pulse radio frequency ablations. Right. So word of caution for all the juniors watching, glossopharyngeal is located in a very dangerous area. So Ravi casually said, hit the thyroid process and give one ml. There are a lot of other structures beside the thyroid yeah. process. The carotid is there, the IJV is there. So... Not a, not a fun block to do. So extremely risky block to do. So uh, don't play around with the glossopharyngeal nerve. So only senior pain physicians should uh, consider attempting the glossopharyngeal nerve block. Can I call in uh, Dr. Matthew here and ask him, is there a role for a surgical approach, a re-exploration perhaps to free up the nerve if we get a diagnostic positive for, let's say, a auricular neuralgia? Is there a surgical role here? Uh, if indeed the, the lesser occipital nerve is cut in the incision, uh, uh, um, there is a role to, to explore the nerve and to put a, uh, a nerve graft uh, and, uh, and uh, an esmos to the cut end. Okay. Okay. Right. And uh, uh, one of my final questions in this topic, can I call in Dr. Joy Sri and ask her, 
Is there a role for a stimulator here, considering this is pretty bad neuropathic pain? Is there a role for a stimulator, peripheral nerve stimulator? You are muted. Okay. As you know, you know, we have nice peripheral nerve stimulators, but again, the question is that um, in order to do any type of stimulator, whether it is peripheral or it is a spinal cord stimulator, or you want to place an electrode in the occipital area, whatever you want to do, the first thing is you need to have a psychologist evaluation, at least in our part of the world. So that is the first thing that you would do because you don't want to be implanting or even trialing somebody who may have some negative outcome or may have other unexplored psychological issues. If the patient gets cleared, in this case, what I would do is I probably would, first thing that I would try is an occipital nerve block. Okay, with ultrasound, all of you know, occipital nerve blocks have become so much more easier. You are not feeding the pulse and trying to inject here and there. So it's worth it. Same way you can target your posterior auricular nerve or even if you place an electrode covering the lesser and greater occipital, you can find out if the patient has relief. With the peripheral nerve stimulators, currently the ones that I have used, it may be hard to anchor, even though you don't have any internal batteries for the peripheral nerve stimulator, and it is very tiny, but still it may be difficult to anchor it. So I would start with occipital nerve stimulator to see if that helps because it's easier to place your lead or easier to anchor. But like I said, before you come to a conclusion that there is no other solution and you want to try a stimulator, you have to make sure that you have ruled out any psychological issues. Right. So uh, I think, uh, just I want to mention one thing as we are discussing about the management and the nerve blocks. There is no, uh, it's a good idea to do little hydro dissection of what, both mm -hmm. the nerves. And uh, that during the block itself will be a therapeutic as well as the diagnostic value. Uh, this is my suggestion. So suppose as the surgery is in the past and Umesh was doubtful that after two years, pain can happen anytime you need triggers. So uh, that can happen after two years or three years. So by doing a hydro dissection, we can, uh, of course, auricular as well as the occipital, uh, we can take the advantage of diagnosis as well as the therapeutic, if at all, patient get relief. Yes, sir. I think uh, totally agreed with this might be uh, entrapment syndrome too. Like uh, he mentioned in the history, sir, there is a scar present in the post-auricular area. So entrapment of this greater auricular nerve can be there. So as suggested by Jadhan, sir, hydro dissection seems to be a good option. Sir. Uh, yes. I wanted to add that for any type of nerve block, I think you should have two to three cc's of saline before you start injecting. So hydro dissection becomes a second nature before you start injecting your local anesthetic. And I think it's safer too because that way you're making sure that there is no CSF blood wherever you are injecting. So I think if all of us make it a habit to have two to three cc's of saline with us before we start injecting, I think that's a great idea. Thank you. So, so you're suggesting once you locate the nerve, you inject three ml of saline followed by the local anesthetic is one to three, but all that I'm saying is you can't have one to two cc's. So have at least two, three cc's of saline handy. So whenever you locate a nerve, at least inject 0.5 to one ml to nicely locate and separate out the nerve before you start injecting local anesthetic.
Uh, yes, agreeing with the Joy Shri ma'am, what she told. Same thing. I was about to, you know, elaborate uh, because it's it's minor surgery. It's not big scar, but still in the area where the surgery was performed, these are all uh, posterior auricular nerve. Some part of maybe less occipital nerve. They these are fine twigs. And, you know, in the scar, there might be like scar neuralgias. There might be chances of these nerves and surrounding muscles getting contracted and entrapment neuropathy, just now what we spoke about. So this kind of hydro dissection will help to release them and giving pain relief. I'm also of the same opinion. Right. Thank you. So, um, so what the panelists seems to agree on is uh, first, uh, the differential diagnosis included dental. So if it is dental, get the sense of red, yeah, work with the dental surgeons and sort this out. If it is a TM joint or a, a bruxism or any root canal or so, if it is a dental origin, work with the dental surgeons. Uh, obviously, if it is coming from uh, the complication because of the middle ear surgery, work with the ENT surgeons and uh, see if that can be sorted out. In terms of diagnosis, we had auricular neuralgia, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, occipital neuralgia, all of them pretty much around the same area. And it could be coming from the cervical uh, spine itself. So in terms of consensus, most of the speakers, uh, the panelists seems to agree that it seems to be coming from the auricular nerve distribution because of the pattern and because of the previous posterior ear surgery scar. So there is a possibility of auricular nerve entrapment. And also, uh, Dr. Umesh, during the imaging, he mentioned that uh, he has ruled out a lot of things, including a long styloid process and the dental opinions have been obtained and ENT opinions have been obtained. So pretty much it leaves us with most likely to be a auricular neuralgia. If the diagnostic uh, block gives more than 50% relief, initially what could be considered is a hydro dissection of the auricular nerve. If that gives relief, we can uh, supplement them with maybe lower dose of neuropathic pain medicine and manage this patient. If you identify this as auricular neuralgia and if hydro dissection is also not helping, there is a role for a stimulator. So you will base your decision based on the result of the diagnostic test. So probably the first nerve to go for a diagnostic test looks like from the panelist opinion, looks like the auricular, then the occipital, then the glossopharyngeal in that order. So uh, any of the panelists, uh, uh, do you agree with this or is there anything else you'd like to add? So well summarized, Patrick. Uh, I, I Only you can do it. I, I disagree, you know. Please, sir, what is the opinion? Hello? Please tell your opinion. I disagree in the sense, I disagree, why I disagree, that auricular or occipital or glossopharyngeal, do they have any supply to the teeth? Why this patient is having the toothache? Can we explain it? Answer is no. The patient's pain Please. is going to the tooth. So... Yes, patient is having tooth from, from you know mandibular tooth up to the occiput, the whole area. And you cannot explain by one nerve. So what is only possibility? Only possibility is if there is sensitization, if there is involvement of the, you know, so one nerve block is not going to help the problem. That is for sure. So what is important here, we will be very fortunate if the Spinopalatine ganglia. Spinopalatine is you know, basically sympathetic. So sympathetic don't have any territory. Sympathetic can go into the wider area. So what is my opinion is auricular might be the first one, but auricular now cannot take care of the pain in the face and the, and the toothache. So spinopalatine will must be a important in the diagnostic block. So I, I fully agree with the diagnostic block, but you know, in your list, you have not mentioned about the spinopalatine. That is why I, I was disagreeing. So spinopalatine must be there because without that, you cannot explain the whole territory. Yes, sir. Agreed. So we'll include the spinopalatine among so the I four. I think uh, they have not mentioned uh, pain in uh, toothache, I think. 
So he mentioned, you know, he mentioned some radiation to the tooth, like, you know, he did mention. So it is mean, not the tooth actually, but it is a uh, ramus of mandible, you can say. Ramus of mandible. Ramus yes. of mandible or angle of mandible. It... Yes. So See, we... I would possibly go with uh, diagnostic trigemino rather than sphenopalatine. No, just to argue. No, it's okay. No. <laughs> Again, again, trigeminal, you cannot explain trigeminal in the, in the occipital area, posterior area, the, that area also cannot be explained by the uh, trigeminal. Then maybe we should do a stellar ganglion block, ultrasound guided. No. That can be done. That is the option, you know. On yes. Alternative to the spinopalatin ganglion block is a stellar ganglion block. So basically what I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize is that the peripheral nerve, which is somatic in nature, have its, its, its limited boundary. And the supply is by that area. We cannot explain the pain of the auricular or the occipital with the ramus of the mandible. So that is what I'm what I'm mentioning, what I'm going to emphasize. That there must be sensitization and there is a possibility of the sympathetic involvement. So stellate or spinopalatine will be a very important option for our diagnostic problem. That is what I'm going to emphasize. What we Gautam is trying to it. emphasize is we should not forget that this could be sympathetically mediated pain and that don't focus just on the sensory nerves. We have to think outside the box and treat sympathetically mediated pain with a sympathetic block, correct? So one more thing right, which right. came into my mind was uh, diabetic neuropathy, but diabetic neuropathy, generally uh, head neck face nerves are not affected, generally uh, limb nerves, upper limb and lower limb nerves are affected. So diabetic neuropathy, uh, can it be the cause of because not, she is diabetic also. Not likely unless she is having neuropathy everywhere else and it also includes the neck. Uh, not likely. So, uh, first case, consensus opinion among all the panelists. Uh, conservative treatment has been tried. All the tests have been done. ENT opinion and dental opinion have been obtained. Uh, investigated thoroughly. So, diagnostic blocks include four blocks essentially. Uh, so, you include the auricular the occipital glossopharyngeal and one of the sympathetic blocks, either a, a spinopalatine or the stellate, and you will base your decision based on the response to the diagnostic block and proceed further with caution. Right. So thank you, Dr. Umesh, for a nice uh, case and uh, making us break our head. The previous cases were all fairly straightforward. So this is one of the cases where all of us had differing opinions and uh, we were breaking our head a little bit. So that's good. So thank you, Dr. Umesh. The only one so, thing, last thing I want to mention that she presently she is on Oxital uh, therapy, Oxital group of drugs, and she has responded remarkably to that. Just I wanted to add. So the thank inter you. the intervention is not required. You mean? No, no, I had done intervention already. So I have what done intervention? diagnostic. What uh, diagnostic can I know? So she has uh, responded to greater auricular uh, block and occipital block itself. Uh, and the hydro dissection which you were talking about, I tried this on the third time when she came. And uh, I discussed this case all in some group also. So pulsed RF, actually, I thought. So I wanted to discuss that also. But the patient is right now not willing for pulsed RF because she is tired of all the interventions. And right now, she has started developing psychological symptoms also. So pulsed RF, again, I don't know. Now, so, uh, Dr. Umesh, what was the result for the hydro dissection and the block? Uh, she, you, has she, she has responded. She has responded. Yes, yes, she has responded to that. Uh, I Which was one? writing in the chat the box. Auricular yes. or uh, occipital? Greater auricular, more she is responding. But uh, the, as she was complaining of the uh, pain radiating towards occipital region, so I additionally, all uh, when she was she came to me, uh, additionally gave occipital block also. Lesser occipital as well as greater occipital, I gave blocks, diagnostic blocks. But she was collectively, she was having 60-70% relief every time. Right. So, thank you very much. Um, I think we have come to some sort of consensus in the first case. Um, can I call the second speaker? Is that okay, everybody? Dr. Dev Jyoti? Dev Jyoti, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Dev Jyoti, please take over. 
Okay, so the second case is for today. Shall I uh, share the screen, sir? Yes. Good evening, one and all. Th I thank uh, Das sir for letting me uh, giving me an opportunity to present this case in front of uh, all the expert members. So uh, my patient was a 45-year-old female patient presented to a hospital with complaints of uh, mainly pain in the right side of the neck since one year. This pain was moderate to severe in intensity, continuous electric shock-like pain radiating to the right upper limb, mainly on the radial aspect of the right arm and forearm till the thumb area since 15 days. It was not relieved by analgesic. She had no progression of neurodeficits or no history of headache or trauma. There's no history of uh, morning stiffness, multiple joint involvements, skin changes, no history of fever, night pain, or weight loss, or any breathing difficulties. There's no history of even blurring of vision, redness of eyes, dysphagia, hearing loss, and gait disturbances. And uh, she was a homemaker by patient. Family history had nothing significant. She also had no history of any uh, other system involvement also, no surgical history also. So on examination of a patient, her gait was normal. She was a moderately built and nourished female, conscious oriented to time, place, and person. And on inspection, the skin over the neck, upper limb, head, and uh, neck posture, everything seemed normal. Her shoulder symmetry also was fine. There was no wasting of muscles. On palpation, uh, mainly on the anterior aspect, first uh, coming to the bony structures, uh, all the bony structures, that is transverse process of C1 or C3, C4 facet joints, C4, C5 vertebral body, or the facet joint and the C6, everything was normal. Soft tissue also, there was no uh, known thyroid swelling or palpable lymph nodes or any tender points. Posterior aspect, there was midline tenderness at C5 to C7 level. Uh, and uh, external occipital protuberance, facet joint, and mastoid process, although was normal. Soft tissue wise, still there was no tender points posterior on the posterior aspect, no palpable lymph nodes, and also no tenderness over the interspinous ligaments. So, range of move, uh, movements, her uh, all over the flexion, extension, lateral bending, and, uh, and rotation was quite uh, restricted because of pain, both passive and active. And uh, sensory examination, cranial nerves was normal. The cervical uh, nerves, only C5 and C6, she had a decreased sensation. Rest of the other nerves were normal. So motor, uh, her neck flexion was painful and even uh, sideways uh, flexion was painful. Abduction of the arm at the shoulder joint was painful. Rest other movements like shoulder elevation, flexion at elbow, extension, palmar grasp and finger abduction was normal. And all the deep tendon reflexes like biceps, triceps, and supinator was also normal. And special tests, uh, Sperling's maneuver was positive. Shoulder abduct abduction relief sign was positive. All the neck distraction test was negative. Valsalva was negative. Jackson compression test was positive. Lermit sign was negative. And even Adson's maneuver was negative. Other, uh, sorry for the mistake, other systems like cardiovascular system and respiratory system also were normal. Investigations, uh, her complete blood count was within the normal range. ESR was 5.5, CRP was 6.5, both almost within the near normal range. And the MRI of the cervical spine showed right side C5, C6 disc protrusion leading to C5 nerve root compromise. So... That's the end of the case presentation. What could be the problem diagnosis? Okay, uh, thank you for the case. Actually, though it is as far as the history, uh, it is clearly evident for the diagnosis. But uh, I am let first ask Ravi. So, what could be the possible other diagnosis? Ravi, are you there? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. What could be the possible other diagnosis, sir? Uh... Taking uh, talking about the history, first one is he has clearly told that it's a C5 C6. Uh, there's a disc uh, at the level of C5 C6. So first one, we talk about uh, diagnosis differential diagnosis under four different categories. First, we will talk about this uh, vertebral uh, spine. So 
there might be the vertebral body fracture. If we are talking about the red flags here, then might be the facet joint orthopathy or the cervical inter, inter, internal disc disruption, it might be. Second thing, we can talk about other structure group of uh, structures that are the muscles. So anteriorly, we have got uh, two flexor muscles, means the myofascial pain syndromes. Third thing, again, uh, we can talk about the other um, differential diagnosis like uh, the, and the neuropathic uh, pain states like uh, global pain, uh, CRPS, post-herpetic neuralgia, and other things. Lastly, the um, criteria includes, uh, means uh, the differential diagnosis includes is the referred pain. Referred pain form, it might be the diaphragm or the cardiovascular system. So these are the things I think uh, that includes in the differential diagnosis. Yes, I think uh, most of the points are covered here. And uh, definitely here in the differential diagnosis, these could be the points. Now coming to Dr. Asher Jadon, that how can we make it a, as a cervical radicular pain from the other diagnosis? How we can differentiate? What are the points in the history that could hit, actually help us to uh, guide towards our provisional diagnosis. Yeah, as Dr. Ravi has mentioned, so three main categories has to be differentiated here. Number one, pain coming from the other areas of the spine like facets or myofascial pain or coming a referral pain from other areas like diaphragm or cardiovascular pain. As patient, other examinations have no uh, like any pointing uh, issue relevant to that particular systemic pain. So referral pain can be excluded at the first go. She's not having any cardiac symptoms. She's not having any dyspnea, not having pain related to deep breathing or not having any other cardiac issues. So that can be ruled out. Now two other points, the uh, muscular pain, myofascial uh, syndromes or the facetal pain. The facetal pain can be there, but the other signs which are being done to evaluate the stretch over the spinal nerve are positive, which most of the time are negative while the facetal pain is there. So this is a very differential point here. Myofascial pain can cause when there is some entrapment of the nerve roots or the nerves particularly supplying that area but that can be ruled out by testing or having some triggers as patient is not having any sensory change or sen triggers in that particular distribution that also can be ruled out. Simultaneously, the MRI as well as the other tests are corroborating very well with the diagnosis of C5, this compression. That is why it is really a very point blank case where the diagnosis can be cleansed and very definitely be said that it is the C5 compression. Uh, am I right, uh, Dr. Devjit? You have actually covered everything. So uh, now let's come to the, I think uh, diagnosis part is uh, I think over. So Ravi, what could be the investigation here? Hey, what uh, we can ask more. But we have already got, apart from that, what we can ask in investigation, any Sir, specific uh, test? Any specific test, talking about uh, the power grade, means uh, is there any motor or sensory loss is there? So I think uh, the miss, this was the missing part. Is, is, is he having five by five grade and compare with the other limb, means the normal limb. So first thing she has missed this, then uh, what we can do is the reflexes the reflexes, especially if we are talking about the C5 nerve compression. So we can also think about this, uh, the bicep, um, biceps reflex. So that's a root value about C5. Apart from this, uh, almost everything has been covered in the history. Then we can also ask for uh, this uh, X-ray cervical spine. So we can get a extra rib or cervical rib compressing the structure. And uh, one of the differential diagnoses was also in the, mentioned in the chat box is the this uh, thoracic outlet obstruction syndrome. So we can also think about that. Apart from that investigations we can do is the MRI, MRI of cervical spine, which has been already done. And it's clearly mentioning the one of the disc at the C5, C6 level. I think uh, uh, one more, sir. Yes, sir. 
uh, if we are considering at uh, as a radiculopathy so we can also think of that needle emg so nc emg and ncv specifically needle emg is more suggestive of this uh, cervical radiculopathy radiculopathy yes actually uh, sometimes uh, it is uh, especially for the beginners i you want uh, me to explain you what is the difference between radiculopathy and radicular pain these terms are sometimes used interchangeably so what is the actual difference because you are telling that so it might be helpful for the newcomers so radiculopathy is the basically the symptoms produced by the compression of nerves at the origin level like here means uh, c and the patient is having compression of the nerve at a c5 c6 level and symptoms are produced distally so these are this is the typical radiculopathy and uh, anything else for what you have asked i missed something i just wanted to uh, make clear that what is actually the radiculopathy and when we call it as radicular pain so what is the difference between these two terms sometimes these so, two terms are used interchangeably na No, so, they are yes, not yes. interchangeably <laughs> acceptable. Radiculop. No, no, no. I, I, I am. I am telling most of the people even do not know the difference. So, so yeah, use, yeah. usually it is commonly used. If you see other Actually, than pain physicians, yes. The radicular pain is the pain because of that particular nerve distribution or having some pressure there. But when these changes are permanent or leading to changes in the morphology or functionality of the nerve, means the nerve is diseased. then pathy is term has to be used so in the yes. beginning the patient as ravi was mentioning about the motor weaknesses then the tendon reflexes when actual pathy has happened then these uh, criteria will be applied in the beginning patient is having only pain but not actually radiculopathy um, uh, i think better take uh, opinion from joyshree also yes madam See, the main yes. thing is you can have radiculopathy without pain, but when you say radicular pain, you have pain in that particular referred symptoms in the referred area. Let's say C five six radicular pain means C five C six nerve root is compressed, and the presenting factor is radicular pain. When you say radiculopathy. There are advanced stages, changes. You may have weakness. you may have other symptoms in c5 c6 but you may not have pain when it comes to radiculopathy you may or may not have pain so that's a big difference the signs symptoms have progressed or the disease has progressed or it has uh, gone beyond where it has persisted for several months that would be the basic difference thank you uh, sir do you want to add anything There was not there for some time. No, uh, um, I, I I heard the discussion. So basically, it it is nicely nicely explained by all of them. So basic difference is one is radicular pain means it is pain without having any other sensory or motor uh, signs. So there will be no uh, numbness. There will be more no uh, the motor weakness. There will be no uh, loss of reflexes. The tones, everything will be normal. That is your radicular pain. And when we call radicular pain. when there will be these symptoms are there pain may or may or may not be there as dr jayashree told that even if the pain suppose somebody is having the you know, only the motor symptoms the loss of uh, power a particular root value then you can call it as a radiculopathy even though there is no pain so pain is not mandatory in the radiculopathy thing is mandatory what is mandatory mandatory is there must be certain sensory or motor signs not just symptoms so uh, we have actually done the differential diagnosis we have discussed about that how we can make with the definitive diagnosis that we have done and what are the investigations required we have already done next come to coming to the management so again coming back to ravi what are the non pharmacological ways so before interventions what are the options that could be tried so before interventions or medicines yes so usually so in most see, i before before ruby is you know starting what is uh, the question for the ruby so here what is very important this patient was having neck pain for one year but the radicular pain has started only 15 days two weeks number one number two is there is no sensory or motor symptoms or signs whatever what what is evident from there 
that they have not mentioned. Only the special clinical case for the root compression or root stretching is positive, but there is no uh, loss of jaw, low motor. So keeping that in our mind, so we have to you know uh, the plan our management. So Ravi, please can you go ahead? Thank you, sir. So basically, we always uh, in literature it has been mentioned that uh, most of this radicular pain means almost data is around forty to sixty percent. they resolve via the conservative management or there is self resolution so conservative management includes initially whenever it is in acute phase so you start with the ensaid with the muscle relaxant then apart from this you add a gabapentinoids or a tricyclic antidepressant that is whichever drug is acting on the pain processing pathway so you usually we prescribe uh, combination of gabapentin and nortriptoma and uh, apart from this you have to also uh, ask for the physical therapy physical therapy that includes avoidance of weight bearing over this structure and that includes the exercises that avoids the forward bending or the flexion of the cervical spine so these are the mostly the conservative medication conservative uh, form of therapy thank you so most of the things are covered uh, so after conservative uh, when should we think uh, about the interventional options or its a surgical option so let's go to dr jaran so when we actually we can refer this patient for interventional uh, or surgical what are the landmarks in uh, this again, two again i would like to I, i would like to give a rewind last time also dr karthik has discussed very beautifully all the conservative measures and the lifestyle changes and also i would include a comment from dr das that patient was having pain for one year and this radicular symptoms for the so then more likely some acute event must have has happened that could be a facetal edema or there the joint effusion or um something which is causing pressure over the nerves and that's how the radicular symptoms has occurred so conservative definitely and also ravi shankar has mentioned that the conservative has almost equal results in about 40 to 60% so in the conservative i would like to emphasize more that giving anti inflammatory giving rest no uh, work or pressure ever uh, had and then intervention and the easiest intervention as you have already asked for the cervical epidural is a multifaceted multi utility uh, i i think possibly the safest um, technique in the hands of the pain physician would should be given a trial which will be a diagnostic as well as the therapeutic importance and uh, might relieve the patient symptoms so that is my take uh, so let's to the guys to ma'am madam any other interventions apart from the epidurals see like everybody else has emphasized this is pain exacerbated in the last 15 days so the first thing is conservative management at least in our part of the world if you don't document that the patient went through physical therapy for at least 6 to 8 weeks and has failed it and has failed nsaids or other muscle relaxants and lifestyle modification nobody is going to approve a cervical epidural period okay and majority of these cases more than 90 or 95% or 96% will resolve with simple therapy lifestyle modification anti inflammatory you don't need anything else so what i want to say is pay attention to how long the pain has been even it has been more than 3 months unless the patient has been through physical therapy and conservative measures do not jump and start doing injections is my uh, uh, recommendation so i think you have to tackle the acute part before you even start discussing injection uh okay. just the uh, what you told right so that should be the you know the protocol that initially it should never jump into the any interventions but uh, definitely exception is there 
exception is failure of the conservative management. Uh, like this case, how Dr. Suvinne presented, was having excruciating pain. And he was been seen by orthopedicians and uh, all, almost all, whatever the drugs has been discussed was taking, he was, he was taking, and there was no relief for last 15 days. So these are the, some exceptions. So where if the pain is too severe, patient cannot sleep, patient's pain, patient cannot sit, you know, patient cannot hang his, you know, patient cannot stand or sit because whenever the hang, hand is, you know, hanging, patient was having excruciating pain and not relieved by whatever the medications has been, you know, discussed. So these are the some exceptions where in some exceptional cases, so the interventions can be done earlier. Yeah, I agree with you. There are exceptions to every rule, but generally we have more fellows and people who are starting right, right. their pain career. So I wanted to be sure that it was understood that if you think it is very two weeks or three weeks and you haven't done therapy or you haven't try, tried anti-inflammatory or sometimes you know you can give stronger pain medication this would be one case where I would probably give the patient some hydrocodone or oxycodone to help them sleep get through pain because ultimately the goal is can we resolve it without intervention if not of course you know the patient will come back to you in a week or 10 days and you will do the epidural if indicated. Back to you. Back to Devjuti. Devjuti, there are other 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 panelists are there. You can take their opinions as well as how they wish to go ahead. Okay. So, Dr. Mathurton, uh, what's your opinion about this? Oh, hello. Um, yes. My opinion Audible. is that uh, I, I want to build upon what uh, Dr. Das said about the uh, long-term ne uh, neck pain with uh, acute radicular pain. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned was facetal edema. Uh, in our, our, our experience, another uh, annular tear is another uh, uh, pathological event in which the juice from the, 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 the nucleus can leak out and this is chemically irritating to the to the nerve you see so uh, I, I suppose that that will respond to anti-inflammatory um, and in your your talking about lifestyle I always tell people who work with computers and IT engineers that uh, it's it's the, the the when they use a lot of handphone uh, the, the the amount of weight brought to bear on c56 is a lot and so the 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 uh, the the trick to to uh, long term prevention of uh, recurrences is to have a good posture, and the good posture in physiotherapy uh, is not only to treat the C five six injured disc, you know, it's actually to mobilize the good discs so that the good discs can take the slack off the the injured disc. So and 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 by taking the slack off the the injured disc, uh, they, you're giving them a chance to rest and recuperate. Uh, so, so that's uh, my, my contribution to conservative treatment. And uh, what's the role of caller? So it is <laughs> actually, I am asking everyone, so that, uh, should we prescribe caller in these patients? Yes or no? What is the opinion of panelists? Please, one yeah, by one. Uh, yeah, can I contribute a little? Okay. Yes, definitely. As we have been discussing about this acute radicular pain, Definitely, in my practice, we follow this protocol, conservative, well discussed by Ravi, medical management, immediately going to physical therapy. There was this one article in 2016, which has shown level A evidence only for cervical stretching and mobilization in case of acute radicular pain. When sir pointed out exactly that 15 days interval, it striked me that there exactly is the role of this cervical stretching and mobilization, well-conducted release therapy by physiotherapist combined with our medical management. 
नो सर्वाइकल कॉलर स्ट्रिक्टली नो इमोबिलाईजेशन आय फॉलो ऍज इज गाईडेड बाय दास सर ऑलवेज बिकॉज दॅट विल गिव्ह राईज टू यु नो इमोबिलाईजेशन अँड लिडिंग टू मसल एट्रॉफी अँड लॉंग टर्म इफेक्ट्स ऑन दॅट मसल विच आर होल्डिंग द नेक सो एक्सेप्ट इन व्हेरी अक्यूट केसेस यु नो फॉर अ डे ऑर टू बट प्रॅक्टिकली फ्रँकली स्पीकिंग आय डोंट ॲडवाइज सर्वायकल कॉलर अँड इन अ फ्यू कपल ऑफ केसेस लास्ट सिक्स मंथ फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम ॲज सर हॅज स्टेटेड आय हॅड पुट अ ब्लॉक विथ अ हिस्ट्री ऑफ टू टू थ्री वीक्स ऑफ पेन बिकॉज दे वर नॉट एबल टू कॅरी आउट इवन फिजिओथेरपी यु नो डुईंग दोज ऑल आर्म एक्सरसाइजेस अँड नेक स्ट्रेचिंग so those were so acute they got admitted in spite of me not ready to do that and they said just do whatever you can madam and then in those cases i had to put epidural with wonderful results post procedure so i could you know uh, get that whole story when joyshi ma'am and gautam das sir were discussing that so Now, i i i used to add add another things you know with all the panelists about if the patient you know everybody will be agreeing that okay 15 days history means here the conservative management is the treatment but obviously exceptions are there but one of the in the conservative management particularly this is very you know popular amongst the neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons uh, dr mathu tung is here i'll be asking his opinion as well what about the oral steroids because in these situations i have seen that the oral steroids have been prescribed and uh, you know we though we pain physicians we are more fond of giving steroid right at the target rather than giving flooding the body with the high doses of the steroid so the pain physicians always you know prefer to give steroid right at the target but i have seen lots of prescriptions about the oral steroids for in other uh, you know ansets anti inflammatory muscle relaxants are not working so this is so if uh, dr mathu tung can throw some light about the oral steroids in his practice I do prescribe oral steroids if it is acute. I do write them a Medrol dose pack and that lasts six days. And that is like we have standard of practice. If somebody comes with pain within 15 days or three weeks or one month, we do write Medrol dose pack. If they have already not been prescribed by their primary care doctor or the orthopedic surgeon or the neurosurgeon, we do prescribe them. So what is the doses of, med- of this methyl prednisolone? Uh, the methyl so dose pack. Methyl prednisolone. Do you prefer methyl methyl means methyl prednisolone? Uh, it is dexamethasone oral tablets, four milligrams. So you start with six times four milligrams, and then you know it is five the next day, four the next day, three, two, and one. That's what is prescribed here. most of the insurances see everything you have to understand is insurance driven okay if i wrote something fancy their insurance will kick it out and say no this is not and we use electronic prescription it's not like you write a script and wait for the patient to respond so when you put your script in it will tell you this is covered or this is not covered so majority of the cases what gets covered is a medrol dose pack Yeah, I was waiting for Matthew doctors. Oh. Dr. Matthew's oh, comment. Oh, I see. Then, uh, okay, um, we do your, prescribe... Your opinion uh, about oral steroid, Dr. Matthew. Yeah, we do. We, do, we, we have uh, dexamethasone in our clinic, but uh, um, we, we prefer to give injections uh, because it's a procedure, you know, a bit of uh, profit-driven. But uh, in I, my I, hospital I, I also, that, sir, and I have seen... that uh, oral steroid also have some very important role sometimes patient themselves don't want injection and they are suffering and i have seen that uh, prescribed by orthopedician or surgeon patient often get relief to the level that they could do the exercise and uh, go for the better path and if uh, they are willing for injection definitely we would like to give injection because that is a more focused approach and with minimal dose we can do what the larger doses and the side effects will do that is that is def- definitely a pain physician takes sir but it works yes okay. because if uh, you are going I about think... the mechanism of the radicular pain in these situations so mechanism of the radicular pain is 
edema of the nerve root edema of the facet joint edema because of the leakage of the nuclear material so of this a lot of chemical things so steroid has definitely uh, have, have some role and uh, the whether it is an oral steroid whether it is an epidural steroid in all these acute radicular pain there is beyond doubt that the steroid has some role just so, madam has raised hand so let her not say no i didn't want to lose my train of thought dr thang or matthew thang brought up a very good point about uh, computer professionals and people working on tablets and computers every day we see more and more neck pain small and some of them have smaller canal congenitally they end up having chronic shoulder neck pain so one of the things that i emphasize to all of them is i teach them some neck stretching exercises myself because uh sometimes physical therapy can be very expensive for some people number one number two when it comes to collar you i don't prefer giving them tight cervical collars but i do tell these professionals who work on computers who work on you know gizmos where you know you go extend your neck as you are typing away because the ideal position for your neck is the steering wheel position but we can't sit like this all day long so one of the things that i tell them the ones who work for 8 to 10 hours or 12 hours is you see there are modified versions of the travel pillows some of them are aromatherapy pillows so as the day progresses to avoid the muscle tension and taking more muscle relaxants i tell them to wear this which would prevent too much extreme of flexion or extension because that little pillow is sitting in between preventing that movement with the neck as they get engrossed and some of the aroma therapy pillows the advantage is you can throw it into a microwave for 10 seconds and you know it is warm in your neck so if they did that and they sat up took a little eyes of their computer or whatever they are doing for one or two minutes by the end of the day they don't feel so much pain and muscle tension this is something that i tell people who work on the computers for hours together so i think little little steps of prevention modification of the lifestyle also goes a long way in preventing chronic pain thank you so, madam so uh, we have dr jeshna as well in our board so what is the we cannot actually i have not seen him yes dr jeshna uh, what's your opinion about collars uh so the uh, acute phase short uh, is okay as it will be helping to prevent a uh, lot of movement and thereby giving some rest to musculature as well and uh, avoids uh, fr- uh, further spillage of uh, nucleus into the canal but for longer duration or for a patient with chronic radiculopathy i guess it won't, won't be helping too much over to you sir uh can oh. i uh, can i add something on collar in this in yeah. in kolkata or in singapore where it is fairly hot usually they they can't wear a collar for 24 hours anyway usually uh, they get very itchy and sweaty so i i a soft collar if it is of comfort usually it is uh, they it is self limiting you you I've never seen anyone really atrophying their muscles because of a a collar, and it is used. Uh, I mean, the patients know when they are well enough to to take it off. Over to you. Okay. Ah, uh, thank you. So we have this. Ah, uh, in and. from cervical epidural condition okay so we don't have anything else apart from cervical epidural sir 
sir i would like to add something sir yes yes sir so apart from cervical epidural uh, here is particularly talking about this case sir uh, all the examination and investigations have revealed that uh, there is a particular nerve involved so you can go with ultrasound guided cervical selective nerve root block okay if uh, it is giving us the positive result say more than 50% with a diagnostic block you can go with the pulse radio frequency ablation of this cervical drg and it is also i think evidence based and evidence is having 2b plus so pulse radio frequency ablation adjust into cervical drg everyone is in opinion with the second one the pulse radio frequency of drg and no I, i think this is not the right time we should wait little more because the pathology is at the disc and we should give enough time to reheal or readjust the body we are giving anti inflammatory drugs we have tried the epidural it will subside the edema we have given the therapy this will reduce the size of disc and if everything fails given the chance for another 3 weeks or 4 weeks time after this management then we can think of what dr ravi is suggesting but yes. i think it is too early to decide this is the right management but when there is a sensory motor changes have started occurring i would not say that let it develop fully but i think this is too early to adopt this particular which is technically demanding and uh, definitely when the pathy is there neuropathy is there we will definitely try this method Yes, sir. Always, uh, I think third line from conservative, second cervical epidural, third we can go with this, sir. So, right. so, yes, sir. so what Doctor Ravi told right that, but that is not the right time yes, in sir. beginning because it is the history is only fifteen days. Another yes. question in the chat box I was seeing that uh, uh, that for several months, if the radicular pain is there, whether the epidural is going to help. Answer is yes. Cervical epidural is one of the very important procedures, even if it's for the several months. Here it is for 15 days, but even most of the times we get this kind of patients who is suffering from the you know uh, for several months, and cervical epidural definitely going to help in those patients. So that is one of the, at least in my experience, I have seen cervical epidural is one of the very useful you know for this radicular pain to take care of this radicular pain. And there is one question there that uh, what about the oral steroids in diabetic patients? So here, I think diabetic management should be you have to discuss with the uh, uh, diabetologist, and you should take in consideration of that before giving steroid. So, any other opinion? If, if the diabetes is weight controlled to... for the short period, giving steroids is not a problem. If the diabetes is weight controlled, but if it is an uncontrolled diabetes, definitely we have to think for it oral steroid rather than in that situations better to go for the epidural steroid because the dose of the epidural steroid will be much limited. It's much smaller dose and a single dose rather than oral therapy. So if the diabetes is controlled, no problem. If diabetes is uncontrolled, you can think in other way. Okay, so I think we have discussed most of the part. So only one part is left as a part of incision. Is that when to refer the patient for surgery? So, uh, Jeshnu, uh, we have not asked any much question to Jeshnu. Let's ask Jeshnu. That when should you refer the patient for surgery? Uh, uh, there are multiple things we can we should be looking after, sir. Like uh, we have loss of reflexes and tender reflexes are lost. Or we have uh, uh, loss of uh, motor functions with uh, grade four or lesser than grade four. Uh, up till the four plus grade is okay. Uh, we can manage it, but for, for lesser than the four plus grade motor power, uh, we should be considering patient to refer to the new uh, spine surgeon. And another important is uh, severe canal stenosis. Like say a stenosis lesser than seven, seven or eight millimeter, seven millimeter should be considered a significant thing, provided that patient is having lot of uh, radiculopathy, and that should be the case where we should be referring the patient to spine surgeon. Right, uh, and then the my question is: Is it dependent on the millimeter, or it is the same terms? It should be considered more. Same concept more is 
but uh, if the it is right, uh, the can stenosis is right then we should be avoiding going for the intervention we should uh, start with the medical myoconservative management and in that case conservative management is not working instead of jumping to survival epidural uh, either we can go for a neuro block as dr ravi rightly said or we can go for a referral to the spine surgeon provided stenosis is too tight Nerve block is with steroid or only the local anesthetic? Sir, this nerve block, what you are saying, is with steroid or only with the local anesthetic? With the steroid, with the non-particulate steroid, because uh, giving only diagnostic uh, nerve block here, the uh, diagnosis is very straightforward. So we know what is the diagnosis, and there is no point in going for only diagnostic block and again going for therapeutic intervention again. Yeah, in that case, we should be going local anesthetic plus uh, non-particulate steroid, neuro block in the root. And in the root. Uh, so, so USG guided, not a fluoroscopy one. USG, uh, not the transfer. Yeah, yes. Sir, I want to ask you about this. But so far, as my knowledge goes, it is uh, now presently it is the steroid in the root is under negative recommendation completely. For particulate steroid, it is de definitely a negative recommendation. Uh, so, what do you say? What to say about this? Uh, can you repeat the question? Actually, so uh, what I have, uh, what what he was telling is that uh, in that case, we should try with a non-particulate steroid, and that is inside the root. We should give uh, a non-particulate steroid. Yes, uh, soluble steroid uh, don't have any contraindications, even if it is in the root. Uh, but of course, even if it is, you know, the the only root, uh, the better, safer. I should not should not be telling better. I should be telling safer. Safer is your uh, epidural steroid, interlaminar epidural steroid, rather than you know going into the root. If you are my my suggestion is if we are planning for the uh, dorsal root ganglion listening, then we should go for the root block and root steroid injections first, and then we can go ahead with the it will be working as a diagnostic, and uh, then later on we can go for the DRG uh, pulse rate frequency. But if in our pl plan is not like that, if you are just going for the treatment with the epidural steroid, then my suggestion is always to go for the interlaminar epidural because it is safety is better. Because there are certain literature which is telling if, when you are going into the foramen, even if you are not giving particular steroid, if you are just puncturing the particular artery, it can go into the spasm and it can cause some of the similar kind of things. So if our plan is not to go for the DRG, why should I go for the, uh, the root block, root steroid or soluble steroid? Uh, theoretically, definitely root steroid can be given, but still it can still can cause the puncture of the vertebral artery and spasm of the vertebral artery. So in my practice, I always go so the, for the, the root interlaminar epidural steroid. Yes, actually, I always prefer the interlaminar one because there are evidences, even with the non-particulate steroid, it was non-occlusive. But because of the spasm, there is chance of ischemia in the special in the posterior part of the brain. So I think uh, as far as the evidence goes, we should try to avoid. Okay, uh, yes, the madam wants yeah. to add. And yeah, uh, actually, yes, I want to say one thing, uh, Dr. Deji. Yes. I think uh, the discussion why it is happening, the root versus epidural, is a corollary to the lumbar epidural because the large volumes and large doses are given. And which are we always say that it is a targeted, should be given the transforaminal is better than lumbar epidural. So to, uh, to in this particular area, as we are saying, cervical epidural is safer, but having the tag of giving larger volume, we can minimize the volume by putting a catheter and taking that catheter to that particular area and using the lesser volume. And that can be done. So this is uh, almost, uh, the, I don't think there is a comparative study, but safety as well as the focused approach can be easily adopted by using the epidural cervical epidural catheter rather than giving the interlaminar through needle. So that is my take. 
मैडम एज अ रूल फॉर द लास्ट ऑलमोस्ट टेन इयर्स नाउ इट इज रेकमेंडेड बाय ऑल द पेन सोसाइटीज इफ इट इज सर्विकल any transraminal injection it is non particulate steroid okay especially cervical epidural you can refer to mark hantoon studies where they showed you know the amount of uh, coronary arteries and the various network that is there in the neck and there were several cases where with particulate steroid there was paralysis so as a rule of thumb most of us if you do any peer review the first thing you look for is did they use a particulate steroid or a non particulate steroid so non particulate steroid anything cervical even if it is thoracic lumbar you are doing transraminal it has to be non particulate steroid for safety reasons number 2 coming to the question of doing cervical transraminals after this journal and analysis of the anatomy mm-hmm. of the cervical spine dr mark hantoon used to be part of mayo clinic now i think he is somewhere in private practice uh, based on that most of us do not do any messy transraminals and secondly majority of the pain societies here for safety reasons will not recommend ultrasound guided transraminal for one simple reason see you can have digital subtraction and see if there is vascular spread even though you think your needle is properly positioned when you do a dorsal root ganglion or transraminal so the only time i would do a transraminal cervical is when the surgeon has specifically asked me to identify whether it is c4 or c5 in that case i would do an anterior approach and it would be half to 1 cc again if possible i would have digital subtraction or at least i would do it with fluoroscopy and that is just to see whether it, he has to operate on c4 or c5 i agree totally with what uh, dr jadhav said if i had to target a particular root which comes up many times you know we don't get those uh, little candy cases where it is a bulging disc and you do a block and the patient gets better that's very rare usually patient has had multiple surgeries and they still continue to have pain in one particular nerve root let's say c5 in that case i would do an internaminal cervical epidural place a small catheter targeted towards that nerve do a dye study make sure it's covering that nerve root and then again inject your local anesthetic if you're doing diagnostic or local anesthetic and non particulate steroid if you want relief transraminals pretty much just targeting the nerve root many of us do not practice because of the safety issues over to you madam so i think uh, this case for the diagnosis purpose is quite straight forward so we have discussed uh, the investigations we have discussed uh, the management options when to go for the surgery and finally what we can say definitely here transforaminal is a good option and definitely conservative management is having a big role and if not responded to anything the last probably the last option could be the surgery and uh, so with this message uh, let us end for the today's discussion thank you all the panelists thank you all the participants for joining this wonderful session i think this sessions will continue every saturday thank you just madam and everyone uh, in the panel for making it a success thank you uh, and thank, thank you, you all thank you gautam for nice moderation yes, thank you kartik and devjani for uh, devjyoti for uh, very good um, you know conducting it properly and very nice questions and enjoyed the session thank you gautam thank you everyone thank you everyone
Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks to Daradia for Thanks the to all the panelists, Thanks all the panelists, idea. Dr. Barsad, Dr. Jadan, Dr. Matthew Tu, of course, Jasridi, then uh, the Ravi, then Jishnu. Uh, am I, am I, anybody's left? Okay. And, uh, and thank yourself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Devjati and Kartik. So you'll be coming up next week again with some other cases. And this will, as Dr. Devjati told, it will be continued for some months, like last year. Last year we continued almost for you know six months, and we had very good, good, good cases and very good discussions. So thank you all.